Hello and welcome to the PyBytes podcast, where we talk about Python, career, and mindset. We're your hosts. I'm Julian Sequeira. And I am Bob Beldebos. If you're looking to improve your Python, your career, and learn the mindset for success, this is the podcast for you. Let's get started. Hello and welcome back, everybody. This is Bob Beldebos. I'm here with Chris May on the PyBytes podcast. Chris, how are you doing? Hello. I'm well. How are you? Yeah, good. Uh, Excellent. It's, uh, we had you recently on uh, episode 119, and uh, now we have you back already uh, because refactoring is is kind of important. Uh, and it's always nice talking with you. So uh, how are you doing today? Likewise. Man, I'm doing really well. It's uh, it's another Monday morning for us. And, uh, you know, like, I can't stay away, right? I mean, I guess, I guess you know, to, to, I have to keep, come back often for the hygiene of, of refactoring and everything. <laughs> yeah, on that note, actually, I was uh, listening to Brian's new podcast people python and yeah. he had brad cannon on yeah and um not sure if you heard that episode but um, it's, it's next in my queue okay yeah so i got good news for you because he was saying that uh him and team and i think is he still at microsoft whatever but they spent like 25 percent on refactoring and it had an enormous gain so oh man that's good to hear yeah. so it was really nice that. hearing that yeah yeah Twenty-five uh, percent. So, like one week per month, they spend on refactoring or improving their tool sets because it goes kind of hand hand in hand. Yeah, <clears throat> that's impressive, it, it, especially that they are given that much time. You know, like I know that uh, uh, I think you saw my talk at Pi Texas. Yeah, and you know, I talked about how I think it was was it ten percent of the time that they were fighting for. Yeah, ten percent of the time they yeah. fought for, and it made a huge difference. So I'm I'm just amazed at twenty five percent. Yeah. And the Google I, yeah. work on your own stuff is twenty percent, and this is this is twenty five percent. That's how about uh, that? Yeah, but he was saying it was actually paying dividends. Like it was a huge, huge boost. So, yeah, Absolutely. interesting. So I thought about you when he was. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, what we're going to talk about today: refactoring, not surprisingly, and specifically, uh, we wanted to talk about the flocking rules, right? That's right, and. Um, yeah, we found that in 99 Bottles of OOP um, by Sandy Metz and uh, Katrina Owen, uh, a book we mentioned last time and uh, you highly recommend it. Yeah. I'm now 42% in, so I'm, I'm making my way through it. It's uh, it's definitely interesting. It doesn't matter that it's uh, Ruby, JavaScript, um, or whatever <laughs> languages they have. They don't have Python, but I'm reading it in JavaScript. It's, it's, hmm. it's very doable, right, coding-wise, uh, because it touches upon these higher-level concepts. And around 20 or 30% in, you come around, yeah, they introduced the flocking rules, right? So do, do you want to tell us what 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 it is and, and why it matters? Absolutely, yeah. Um, and, and one thing I want to, well, let's describe what the flocking rules are first. There are essentially three simple rules that um, allow you to refactor your code and, and allow great design to emerge from the code you already have. And so step one is, you select the things that are most alike. You know, you look through your code, find what's most alike. And then two, you want to identify the smallest difference between them. And sometimes you might want to rearrange your code or something like that. Like they, they show a couple of examples later in the book and, and Sandy has shown in some of her talks that like sometimes it's nice to like, you know, even just change how you're like formatting things, or whatever, just make it as obvious as you can what the smallest change is, uh, smallest differences between your two pieces of code. And then the third step is make the simplest change that will remove that difference. And, and they suggest doing it in four phases, which they call parse the new code, parse and execute it, parse, execute, and use its result, and then delete unused code. And the way I think about it, like um, I, I essentially uh, think about those four steps as like creating a new component and like running your tests to make sure you have no syntax bugs, implement your solution, um, on on that new thing to make sure there and, and running tests to make sure no, there are no issues with uh, how you implemented it, and then essentially hook up or replace one of the differences with a called to new component, um, and then you run your test to make sure the behavior is the same. So I mentioned it's really hard if you're listening on audio <laughs> to really get this. Um, the good news is, um, as we mentioned in the last episode, I have the refactoring Python refactoring toolkit. And the free version has the flocking rules in it. So um, I want to, you know, I feel like it's so important that everybody should really know what the flocking rules are. Awesome. Well, we'll link to that. So uh, 
And there, you, I guess you give a more practical example then, right? I would think so. Honestly, I, I wanted to try to download the free version just so I could see exactly what's in it today, but I ran out of time before our podcast. Sure. Um, yeah. But but that saying, I mean, like, you know, like I'm available on the, on the PyBytes Slack and like, I love talking about refactoring. So, and, and the flocking rules are something like once you really get it and see it in examples, um, it's really powerful. Yeah, it is. And uh, <laughs> again, going back to doing that, making that extra effort continuously, right? To to keep your code base sane so you don't, you know, add up technical debt over time. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. By the way, I think talking about Slack, didn't we make like a, a dedicated refactoring channel last time? That's right, or we did. I hallucinating <laughs> right now. <laughs> so yeah, just a quick, uh, you know, shout out to our community. People join and uh, hit us up in the channel, right? To further discuss this. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So making small, gradual changes, and I guess between every phase, run your test, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. To see if you don't mess anything up. And one thing I like about the flocking rules in particular is, so Sandy and Katrina uh, are two senior level developers. They're trainers. They work in Ruby, and they wrote. They wanted to write the ninety nine bottles of object oriented programming, but to like, let me take a step back. Sandy has already written a book on like, I think it was practical object oriented design or something like that. And the two of them wanted to like write a book that just even distilled further down how to write good software with classes and, you know, testing and all these things. But they knew that they needed a way to kind of explain refactoring. And obviously there's the Martin Fowler book, which is impressive. And for me, at least it was hard to get into. And it's dense. Yeah. I guess it's and, a catalog of hundreds and hundreds of refactorings, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I think they both had read that book and like one of them was very well knew how to refactor, you know, and they were working on a piece of code together. And uh, one of them was like, hey, I, I can't see what we need to do here. I, I wonder how we can make this better. And the other one was like, you know what? I, I can totally see it. We need to introduce three classes and, you know, be, make these things behave in this way and, and we'd be great. And the other one was like, how do you see that? And they talked for a while and realized like if the if the one that could see how it, to refactor couldn't explain why and how, there was a there was an opportunity for uh for for teaching here. And it took them two years to come up with these flocking rules, which is impressive to me, not only that they stuck through it and spent these two years, but it's it really it's 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 amazing how it literally allows great design to emerge from your code and i think in particular it's so important because with fowler's book which i don't want to disparage because it's really good to know all of those refactorings but what you tend to do is you pick one that's either your favorite or one that you know well and it's essentially pretty easy to pick one that is forcing you down a line that may not be the best for your code whereas the flocking rules actually like I said, again, allow great design to emerge from your code. Ah, okay. So I, I, I see. So I think this is important to highlight, like more like the established refactoring literature has your code towards a design where if you follow the flocking rules, you're going inside out from the code and the design pattern naturally occurs. Exactly. Which is then more in line with your code without kind of forcefully... I have to do a facade. I have to do ABC, right? Whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. And, it, and it's, it's funny too, because it's like, like I know this, right? And I'm working on my, the project I'm working on now, I introduced all these classes and a hierarchy to like try to handle all these things. Cause I'm like, I'm, I'm even doing test driven development. I'm like, I know what I want to do here. And I think this is the right way to do it. But I took like five steps and real, like kind of realized I kind of got lost and I don't know quite what I'm doing. And I've realized, okay, I need to just get reset hard and start over from the flocking rules. And 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 the the, the solution actually ended up much simpler. I didn't need all these classes. And yeah, like I, I just cannot tell you how impressed I am with with the two of them to to come up with this this gem. Um, yeah, it's impressive. Yeah, because if you read uh, Fowler's refactoring, you can get a feeling of well, everything has been said. You know, it's the Bible of refactoring, right? There's yeah. that's it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So that's, yeah. that's an interesting take. Yeah. 
And yeah. I think it also goes back to we just don't know the design up front often. Yeah. So we have that first draft. Like I think Brian was also discussing that on mentioned podcast. Like like we we call it first draft in writing. We don't call it first draft in, in coding, but it it is like that, right? There are different phases of software. And that's why yeah, when people ask me do do a design pattern overview, I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> like, I, <laughs> I mean, we need to know what the common patterns are, but it so mm -hmm. much depends on your code, right? That usually it only makes sense to apply design patterns when you already have your solution and you're refactoring. So, yeah, Very so true. this approach makes a lot of sense. Speaking of which, like one um, resource for, you know, like there's the, with the gang of four patterns and all these different patterns. One resource I found was exceptional for Python is um, Brandon Rhodes Python Patterns. Are you familiar with that? Amazing. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> he's one of my favorite uh, PyCon speakers, right? His talks are, yeah. are amazing. And yes. uh, he does a great job because the Gang of Four book can be quite dense. Um, although it, I think, I mean, it's it's more from the Java background mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the old days maybe but mm -hmm. I, I think it's still worth reading but I think you can if you <laughs> invest 20 30 percent of that time and just go to Brandon's blog and read those entries um you probably can do it quicker and it's also Pythonic right so yeah. you will notice that some of the design patterns he discards because mm -hmm. the standard library or the way we do things in Python has you already covered right so you get a nice distillation of what really matters with python and for it are definitely for example the um uh composition over inheritance brilliant i often yes. link to that right to when people go too deep into oop or inheritance it's like no look at that you know that's yeah. that's also how you can do it it's it's, it's really good, good yeah, I, yeah i i i reread it you know like like take a section and reread it like every few months because it, it, it's amazing you can read it and just have such appreciation for it and and it just fades away and then like coming you know coming back rereading it it just oh i didn't even know that was there <laughs> you know and that's at python hyphen patterns dot guide in case you're wanting to, to, yeah. to see this you're going to definitely link that yeah 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 awesome cool um I think that wraps up the flocking rules. Anything else you wanted to say about that? I guess the only other thing that that uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, I just wanted to re reiterate too, is that the other thing that I think is most um, powerful about this and also kind of counter to a lot of the ways we work, at least the way I work, is to take small steps. And whether it's, you know, it, like as I'm learning more about test-driven development, refactoring, the smaller steps you can take, even commit sometimes, you know, into your your change control, the better off you're going to be. And you know, for me, it's hard sometimes to kind of shift out of like problem solving mode to remember, oh, that's a small change. Let's commit. That's a great sure. point. Yeah. And it's also kind of similar to all these best practices in software, like write smaller functions, right? Do yeah. smaller commits, right? Like the smaller and more isolated your changes, the easier. I, I remember watching those uh, destroy all software videos from Gary Bernard in back in the day. Oh yeah. And remember he was doing like these small commits and he wanted to make sure that with every commit his his test suite would run because you know, then he had that option to revert a commit or it, it just, it has more points in time, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's more controlled and um, yeah, and it's, it's hard because I think we still, we all are uh, doing too big, pull request too much in one commit um but yeah yeah tell me so, a bit more about that what, what the advantages of that overall well, yeah it's interesting like because I, I feel like I, I wonder where we get this instilled but it almost feels like we it, there's almost like i don't know if it's, if it's a bravado or there's there seems to be this pressure that i get that like oh i need to get work done and to get work done i just need to plow through you know it's almost like you're I find it when I'm focusing too much on getting a feature out the door, I let everything go to crap. You know, like I, I, I don't, I'm not disciplined to follow all the disciplines that I know that I should follow. But in particular, like if I can, like, I think like you said, it well, like small st steps enable me number one, to make sure I don't overextend myself. Um, Cause like in programming, we're so, it's such a mental, you know, challenge. And if you move too fast, it's you're almost putting too much state into your head to try to remember. 
And so if you work in smaller cycles um, and then commit them and, you know, run your tests, you're much better. You have guardrails. You've got, you can, you know, have less state in your mind. I imagine you're going to be less tired at the end of the day, <laughs> which I need to hear this for myself. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, it's surprisingly important, I would say. Cool. And, and maybe that's also a nice segue into, uh, into the <laughs> building a second brain, talking about having too much <laughs> stuff in your head. So yes. uh, I picked this up when your recommendation uh, i'm only like 50 pages in right now as mm -hmm. you said before we're reading too many books um <laughs> but yeah totally already sold you know no taking getting back into that getting more disciplined with it just to get it out of my head so yeah. while i have you here i uh <laughs> as you have been further in that process i obviously having read the book and and implemented i just wanted to know yeah what's your uh what's your second brain look like it's interesting. Like, so I still, I'm, I'm likewise still working on the book. I, I, I lost my bookmark. It's so I forget exactly how far in I am, but um, I know, you know, whatever the point is, is that, uh, you know, for the last maybe three years, I've been building my second brain in obsidian and it really is. Um, I feel like it's my treasure trove. Um, it, my uh, refactoring um, toolkit that I mentioned earlier, that it started off as I want to understand refactoring better. And so I started with a few notes in Obsidian and then I kind of deep dove and everything I could find, I put in there. Um, and and literally it has, so, um, you know, notes for this podcast are in there. I have it linked to my note on the flocking rules. Uh, it, in addition it, 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 I want to say it has my life in there. It's not entirely true because there, there are people who um, really go deep in um, like the personal knowledge management uh, world and they have, you know, dashboards and trackers of what they're doing right now. I'm just focusing on like, if I find an article that I find interesting, I capture the URL. And if I'm, if I have time to read it, I will, read it and write down why I think it's good. What what thing I want to remember from that blog post. Put it into Obsidian. Um I have it paid we 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 pay to have it like synced so I can like within moments after typing it in my computer, it's on my phone. And yeah, it's really amazing like how often something comes up, you know, in a meeting or as I'm programming something, I'm like, wait, didn't I remember like there was an article on this. And I can just quickly search and pull up the the note and it's there. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really cool thing to have. Yeah. Awesome. No. And it doesn't also, not, it doesn't sound like it's a very complex thing to, to, to implement, right? It's yeah. not rocket science. It's, it's just it's, <laughs> get it out of your head, uh, decide upon a tool that works for you. That's probably, yeah. Like obsidian, I use Dropbox, uh, something that's available both in your desktop as your phone, and then just mm -hmm. pump information in it and maybe also not worry I think it says like don't worry about categories that that can all change so for me it's uh i the, you remember that other book about zettelkasten uh how to yeah. take smart notes like yeah. that zettelkasten system for me that's overkill like yeah. uh with all these indexed cards and sequence numbering i couldn't get that to work so what i do yeah. these days i have just a dedicated folder in my dropbox uh, i have some shell aliases to quickly add a note oh nice um, and it's building up an index by tags and that's about it so it's just flat files. And then from the command line, I can just use AG or grab to yeah. search through it. And that's probably all I'm going to need. I'm not sure if it scales, but <laughs> for now, uh, it's only like the discipline to actually use it because I set that up a year ago. And and now thanks to the book, I'm actually, it reminded me like, yeah, you, you need to put those notes in, right? It's mm -hmm. not going to stick here. That's one reason why I love Obsidian too, because it's just flat files as well. It's a markdown. It, every note is a markdown file in a folder on your computer. And so it just has, you know, a little bit more, it has a UI and some intelligence around it. It makes it easier to link to notes and jump between notes. But just like you're saying, like <laughs> whether I have Obsidian open or not, I can just, you know, use the silver searcher to 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 find something I need or yeah, it's it's impressive. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, when I said AG, it's it's actually a silver searcher. Yeah, well, so, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, rec recursive grep. <laughs> the funny thing is, I yeah, couldn't think yeah. of the the name. Because... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, cool, awesome. 
No, that's uh, that's useful to know. So yeah, people check out Build a Second Brain by uh, Tiago Forte, and um, I think it will uh, it will boost your your productivity. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's really inspiring too. Like a uh, later in, like I'm in a chapter where where so the he has a um, his thought is like you can air out, you can have problems in a couple of ways, right? You can not collect enough, and you can collect too much. And so one phase of it is. Um, is essentially like a like trying to help you not collect too much by like saying is this really important uh, but then also like kind of essentially going back through certain notes and kind of really distilling in what what is this why is this important to me and and helping you to understand it um yeah and so i, I he has a, a you know like he's able to he's found really inspiring stories in there um and this one in particular was about this unknown director who um you know, Hollywood, Hollywood, I can't remember the name of the Hollywood, you know, uh, group that they wanted to to do a story, a particular story on a book. And all the directors turned them down. And they finally went to this one director who was operating in like San Francisco instead of Hollywood. And he turned them down initially, but then was reading the book and was like, you know what? No, I think I could really make something special out of this. And he started going through the book, taking notes, not only about like what jumped, especially like what jumped out at him and what emotions he really kind of wanted the, to, to emphasize that the story was telling. And he literally, he wrote in marginalia in the book. And he also created a, I think a bound book for himself where he would collect all of his thoughts. And, um, and he essentially ended up with this big bound book that he used as his guiding principles to make the, the movie, the Godfather. And, yeah. And so now, of course, we know Francis Ford Coppola and the amazing thing that The Godfather was. And it's all partially because of his little personal knowledge management of like really just distilling what it was important for him uh, about the story. That's amazing. <laughs> well, that's a nice story to to wrap it up. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, anything else you wanted to, to share? To um, talk about? Just uh, just a reminder for my Python refactoring toolkit. You can get it at everydaysuperpowers.dev slash toolkit. Um, I'm online at, you know, I'm not as available, not as I, I'm, I have Twitter at underscore Chris May. I'm not as active on there, but if you reach out to me, I would definitely reply, but I'm more on Mastodon or Fostodon at underscore Chris May as well. Um, and my website, everydaysuperpowers.dev. I try to put blog, very useful things up there. Uh, of course, you can also reach me on the the Python Bytes Slack channel. I'm active there and enjoy the community there. So uh, that's about all I can think of. Awesome. So faster on mm -hmm. I'm at Slack. And mm -hmm. uh, well, first of all, your blog <laughs> <laughs> and subscribe. You do uh, send out emails as well. Useful mm -hmm. uh, stuff every week or every other week. But uh, yeah, yeah I could, it, sometimes I do every week. I try to do every week, but uh, I've been really busy recently. So it's not been as as. Uh, yeah, but I try to make it very useful no matter what. Yeah. Short and attest. useful. I can <laughs> attest that. Yeah. Thank cool. you. Cool. Well, thanks for uh, being on today again, Chris. It was, uh, it was always fun and insightful talking with you. So thanks for yeah. sharing your, your knowledge and experience. I am sure the audience will get a lot out of it. And uh, yeah. We'll thanks surely, for having uh, me on. We'll surely have you back another day to dive into more uh, coding, design, refactoring, whatnot. Sounds wonderful. Awesome. Have a good day. You too. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed this episode. To hear more from us, go to pybyte slash friends. That is pybit.es slash friends and receive a free gift just for being a friend of the show. And to join our thriving Slack community of Python programmers, go to pybytes slash community. That's pybit.es forward slash community. We hope to see you there and catch you in the next episode.